I'll do what I wish when I wish it. I'll thank you to release those reins. Alice, there's no need to be so angry with me. Is there not? After what you did to me yesterday? Or is that of no consequence in your eyes? You can hardly blame me for that. You were trying to go through my luggage. The drug was merely a sleeping draught I used to protect my cases when I travel abroad. You'd be surprised how many foreigners have tried to rob me. A feeble excuse. Then I'll try to invent a better one. Please, Alice, don't be so harsh in judging me. I assure you that I bear neither you nor anyone dear to you any malice, nor do I intend to cause harm to them. But I have work to do, and that work must not suffer. Work? Work that involves that thieving little friend of yours, no doubt. I know he's not the most appealing person, but he does have his good points. Such as his skills at burglary. There are times when such skills do come in handy, yes. At Fulbright Hall. Alice, I resent the implication that I intend or intended to rob your family. Do you really think that little of me? I don't know what to think of you. You evade simple questions, you sneak about my home, and you ask me to trust you. How much of a fool do you think I am? Tell me what I want to know. What are you doing here? I am not at liberty to tell anyone that right now. In a few days, perhaps, but not now. There is too much happening, and too many people involved. When you passed me earlier, Miss Smith was with you. Where is she now? I don't see why that is any of your concern. Let me pass. She hasn't gone to the factory, has she? I refuse to answer any more of your insufferably rude questions. I take it that means our enterprising friend is engaged in something most likely foolhardy and probably dangerous as well. Why won't any of you leave well enough alone? Why won't you let me alone? Why can't we just strike a match? If we had a light, they'd be able to see us. And wouldn't come, would they? I know that, but I resent being forced to act as a camping ground for so many dratted insects that can see me even in the dark. Wait a second. Light. That's it. That's what? Last night, I saw lights under the sea out there in the bay. At the time, there was something that struck me as odd about them, but I couldn't place it. Now I have. What sort of lights will burn under water? Only electrical. Ah! So if there's lights under the bay, that means they're part of the factory system. Right. Yet another probable connection between our friendly philanthrope and the mystery. Why don't we just tell the police? Because it's all circumstantial. Nothing that definitely ties him to anything, much less to a crime. Even if those lights are his... There's no crime in lighting up the seabed, is there? So that means... Shush! Grave robbers. Mr. Doyle! Mr. Doyle! Billy, whatever is the matter? Quick, we've got to warn the doctor. His friend. She was in the graveyard. Two men that took her to the factory. Good Lord. She was supposed to be recuperating at Fulbright Hall. What the dickens was she thinking of? Still, no time to worry about that now. Billy, are there any of your regular friends you can rouse? Aye, I should think so. If there's one who can ride a horse, the doctor has one stable here at the tavern. Send a message to Sir Alexander Cromwell and tell him what's happened. He'll have to organise the forces of the law. I'll go and raise the doctor. The game has just become a trifle more urgent. On your way, Billy. Right, oh, sir. No need to raise me, Doc. We ride at once. Right, Doctor. Do we storm the walls, break down the gate, or what? I'll go for the what. We aren't the first people to arrive here tonight. Unless I'm very much mistaken. There goes a man I'm more than eager to have a few words with. Quickly, follow me. But don't shoot or make any untoward noise. Doctor! I was not expecting you quite yet. I didn't think you were, but it was a smart move to hold off using that rifle of yours. As it is, you're a sight too free with it for my liking. I had no option. There are always options, but what I want right now are some explanations. 
You've played the man of mystery long enough. Doctor, can't this wait until later? Miss Smith could be in grave danger inside there. Oh, nothing a few moments now will affect. And Colonel Ross's information may aid us considerably once we penetrate that layer. What have you been hiding? Aside from that scoundrel, Breckenridge, who did you expect to find in there tonight? <sighs> My brother. Back in the land of the living, are we? At least for the time being. I ask you to explain that comment, but I doubt I'd like the explanation. Probably not. Dear me, Miss Smith, your inquisitive nature has really caused you trouble this time, hasn't it? Oh, I'd say it was about par for the course. Judging by that boy in the tank, you are responsible for the mermaids. Speaking of which, what is the course? Miss Smith, you have a terrible habit of wanting answers to questions you shouldn't even be thinking about in the first place. Haven't you ever heard the old saying about a little knowledge being too dangerous for your health? If a little knowledge is dangerous, where is the man who has so much as to be out of danger? Thomas Henry Huxley. Oh, very good. You have quite a wit about you. Of course, it is about all you do have about you. And, speaking of danger, you are in it, and I am not. I suppose that makes me the man that you refer to. And what makes you think that I'm in danger and you aren't? Oh, you really are something special. Miss Smith, uh, may I call you Sarah? Miss Smith sounds so formal. No, by all means. Let's dispense with formality. I'm not one to stand on etiquette. A stepladder, maybe, but not on etiquette. And what do I call you that's polite in mixed company? My name is Ross, Sarah. Ross? You wouldn't happen to be related to Colonel Edmund Ross, would you? He is my brother. Ah, and what do your friends call you? Assuming you have any, that is. All men are friends, Sarah. Mr. Breckenridge, for example, is a very good friend of mine, who I've allowed to call me personal. I imagine I could extend that courtesy to you, too, while you are still with us. Charmed. I would shake hands, but it's a trifle difficult at the moment. Percival, what are you up to here? My, my, my. Curiosity killed the cat, Sarah. And I'm afraid it's going to kill you too. Can we just drop the corny literary allusions? If you intend to kill me, where's the harm in telling me what I got to die for? Why not? Immediately you have to die, because I sent those two blockheads after a dead body and they brought me back two live ones instead. Kipling's still with us, I take it? For the time being, yes. As soon as that chamber has been vacated, i will probably end up in there. I'm not entirely certain that the process will work on someone who has so evidently passed the point of puberty as Mr. Kipling. But if it kills him, then it saves me the bother of having to see to the task personally. And if it doesn't kill him, then we got another worker. You, my dear, are obviously considerably past the age of puberty yourself. The process would definitely kill you, which is, I am sad to report, your face anyway. But it would also damage your eternal organs, which would be a terrible waste. Yes, I'd hate to see my organs going to waste. You know what they say about a mind being a terrible thing to waste. It's a shame that you'll be staying with me, albeit in a number of small containers. I really would have liked a chance to spar with you a little more. Well, you can't have everything. You may have my body, but you'll never have my mind. Unless you intend to pickle that too, but aside from the fascination of taking my liver out on a date, why do you want my body parts so badly? For my work, Sarah. As you can see, I've managed to create my own rather unique life form. I believe you came face to face with a number of my creations over the past few days. Yes. Mutant hounds, killer seals, and a rather pretty young mermaid. The tip of the iceberg. Here, in this laboratory, I have the means to achieve fusion of different animal species, combining their traits to form prototypical creatures that, before now, existed only in the imagination. Thanks to me, mermaids exist. I can't quite bring myself to believe this is just a hobby for you. I mean, most people take up collecting butterflies or stamps for a pastime. Are you just doing all this because you can? Sarah, how better you must think I am. Though I must admit that part of this is merely the desire to see what limits I can break. 
But my experiments do have a noble end. I am creating separate species of human beings that will take mankind beyond the oldest boundaries imposed by our species. My merfolk are the first, if we don't include that dreadful hound boy, which was unplanned, but I hope to create more very shortly. Imagine crossing human beings with cheetahs, for example, and creating a race with the endurance and cunning and prowess of the major cats. What warriors and athletes they might become! Or taking a simple bat and making from it winged beasts that could ride the air currents and really fly. Isn't that a project worthy of great imagination? It's certainly great something. You can't be serious! How can you say that after all that you've witnessed? My powers are quite real. The merfolk are alive. Their bodies stable. And they are viable. Do you understand what that means? Yes. That they can have children when they mature. And that they will breed true. Precisely. If I were to step aside now, the merfolk would continue to live and grow. I have done what no other man has done before. I have created a new breed, a new genus, as my legacy. I have achieved what nobody has dreamed of before. Least of all that obnoxious, overbearing older brother of mine! I suppose it's partly my fault from the beginning. Everything Percival has ever done in his miserable life was an attempt to either prove that he was a better man than me, or else try and hurt me for being what I am. And what are you? If you're merely a military man, I'm humbug. You remind me a little of a brigadier chappy I know. I have been attempting to avoid answering that question since I arrived here, Doctor. But in the interest that seemed to have linked us, I have little choice left to me now, do I? None at all. If I don't like it or don't believe your replies, Doyle and I will trust the two of you up here and mark you do not open till Christmas. I am a special agent working directly under the command and authority of Her Majesty Queen Victoria. It is my job to investigate those matters that lie outside of the conventional. You can prove that claim, I take it? Don't be an idiot, man! In this line of work, how long do you think I'd last if I carried papers that proved I was under explicit orders of the Queen herself? Quite frequently, I have to operate outside of both the law and this country. I'm inclined to believe most of what you said. As I say, you have the same manner as the Brigadier about you. Brigadier? What Brigadier? Oh, I'll explain later. But I don't believe that shooting the Hound was under explicit orders from anyone. There was no need to kill that poor creature. Doctor, you do not seem to understand what my brother is capable of. I am attempting to eradicate every last foul deed he has perpetrated. But what were you doing at the hall? I first latched onto these experiments of my brother's in London. There, he had set up an inhuman laboratory to experiment upon living creatures. He's long been fascinated with the concept of improving on the works of nature. He's read Darwin's On the Origin of Species while in college, and decided that natural selection was an inefficient means of advancing change. So he's elected to try unnatural selection. Precisely. But how does he achieve this? Technology on the Earth in this time period is certainly not up to anything on the order of change that he's managed. What is he doing? I really have no idea how he works the technique. Science is a background study for me. I know enough to get by on my missions, but little more. Percival is, in fact, the genius where that is concerned. Genius, my foot! What he's doing is beyond impossible. I suppose I shall have to ask him of his laboratory methods myself. What else? Well, his experiments cost a great deal of money and he was financing some for the proceeds of, well, the production of extremely fine replications of the official currency. We destroyed his presses, but by the time I was certain that was done, he had fled. I had seen his first experiment, that poor unfortunate hound, and when the reports of a gigantic beast on the loose reached me, I knew it had to mean that Percival had begun to work again in this vicinity. The problem was deciding where, since he needed a good deal of cash for his work, and there was no chance he could be printing it this soon. The only two people in this area with sufficient wealth were either Sir Edward Fulbright or Breckenridge. Ah, and you chose to investigate Sir Edward first. Precisely. A foolish error, which has caused a good deal of trouble and inconvenience for me. But why him? Surely in his line of work, Breckenridge was the most likely suspect. Yes, and to my mind that made him less likely. You see, Percival employed a pair of assistants in London named Raintree and Brogan. Both men are currently employed as security officials at Breckenridge's factory. I reason that Percival planted them there as bait to lure me from the current scent, 
since it was otherwise ludicrously obvious where he was. Oh, wonderful. Your devious little mind overlooked the obvious because it was obvious. I'll bet your brother is chuckling about that still. He probably is. There was another reason also. I could gain simple entry to Fulbright Hall because my old college chum, Roger Bridewell, had become engaged to Sir Edward's only daughter. I told him enough of my suspicions to make him willing to do anything to clear the suspicions against his future in-laws, so he managed to get me invited to the hall. I'll admit, I was not the most popular guest they had ever entertained, but I did manage to confirm that Sir Edward was innocent of involvement. That left only Breckenridge. And so you elected to break in here tonight to check on your suspicions? Oh yes. I realized you were going to come here eventually. I had to beat you to the mark. I knew. But you seem to have anticipated my moves. Sheer dumb luck, if that's any consolation. I'd planned to be here later, but Sarah has managed to force my hand. Sarah? What has she done? Oh, managed to get herself captured by your brother at a guess. Then we had better end this conversation and get inside fast. My brother needs three things for his experiments. Young children, who become the victims of his changes. Animals, for which he makes the extracts to affect those changes and fresh corpses, from which he extracts human elements. These he uses on living animals, giving them humanoid speed and wits. I fear that Sarah is about to become the late Miss Smith. Have you ever been to Limehouse, Sarah? No more than I've been forced to. Understandable. I always found it a loathsome place. Its name comes from the lime kilns that burn there. And you have really no idea what a dreadful stench they produce. And the whores that patrol the streets there, painted Jezebels whose faces would fall apart if they washed off the layers of makeup they wear. And the men who seem to be engaged in discovering the limits of human endurance when it comes to preserving their lives in alcohol. A disgusting place. The cesspit of the planet. I was there for three years. You can always tell a man by the company he keeps. Most droll. I had little option, though. I needed a place where I could procure subjects for my experiments without too many questions, and a place to dispose of my failures without arousing too much concern. I founded what I like to call a charity hospital, though the patients mainly contributed to me through their deaths. I used this as a cover for my experiments and probed the vast unknown areas of evolution without notable success. Until one day, the answer came to me in a flash. Take up gardening instead. No, I speak of a literal flash, Sarah. A star fell on Limehouse. The locals called me, since they were terrified that the heavens were visiting divine vengeance on them. If God Almighty had done so, I couldn't have been too surprised. But it was nothing quite like that. As my carriage arrived at the place where the so-called star had fallen, I immediately realised that I was in the presence of something from vastly outside my limited sphere. The star had descended amidst some old warehouses that had been abandoned down by the river. They were ready to believe that the flames were the product of old Nick himself, I think. Several wounded people had crawled out of the area, where vagabonds spent their miserable nights waiting for the dawn of bleak days. Despite the fear of the locals, I could see that what I was confronted by was certainly not celestial in nature, at least not in the sense of the word that they chose, but there was something inside that broken building that lived, because I could hear a strange screaming. It was a little like the cry that an animal in mortal pain would make shortly before it expires, a sound I've heard many times in the past. Stealing myself, I walked carefully into the damaged area. The greenish glow of the flames made everything appear supernatural but I felt that at the heart of this mystery lurked something considerably more mundane. I was, in fact, utterly wrong. Oh, I admit it freely, I was out of my depth at the start. I came across shattered and blazing chunks of metallic substances and strange broken instruments of a kind and order that I could not even begin to comprehend. It started to dawn on me that I was in the presence of some kind of transportation device, a flying cab, if you like. It had suffered some calamity and come crashing down to earth. Excitement mounted within me as I pressed forward. In the centre of the area of destruction lay the core of this conveyance. It had once been large and circular. The interior of the craft had suffered no less damage, but it was still in one piece. After a moment, in which I fought off the noxious smoke fumes from the craft, I began to make sense of what I was witnessing. It resembled a jellyfish somewhat. 
being almost shapeless and gelatinous, but it was far too large for any such beast. It came some four feet across, and the source of the screaming sound I had followed to this very spot. That this was no mere animal was apparent, because it was as burnt and damaged as the cap itself, yet it was moving with volition and purpose. I was torn by indecision. This hideous creature was obviously asking me to risk my life to get it somewhere from the craft. I saw no need to endanger myself to do anything for a being so repulsive. And then again, had the creature been the Archangel Michael himself and asked me the same thing, <laughs> I'd have been a little inclined to aid him. The only thing that prevented me from leaving the thing to die was a single thought. If, in its dying moments, the being desired something brought to it from its ship, it must be something of immense value. In which case, I could use it better. Protecting myself as best I could from the flames, I plunged into the wreckage. Inside the compartment was a single container. This was obviously what the being desired, so I snatched it up and fled the star cab. I brushed past the spectators and hurried back to my laboratory with the treasure, still uncertain of what I had found. Yet it had come from a craft that had never been constructed by human hands. Whatever I had salvaged, I reasoned, must be worth a fortune if I could only deduce its purpose. In safety and peace of my laboratory, I opened the container to discover it filled with a gooey semi-liquid. At first I couldn't comprehend what it was, and then it finally came to me in a moment of inspiration. This was some kind of healing gel from the dying creature. I had suffered a number of small burns in the fire, and so I hesitantly applied a small amount of the gel to my skin. I knew that I could be making a terrible mistake. The creature had not been human by any stretch of the imagination, and perhaps its metabolism was vastly different from my own. What might cure the shapeless creature might serve only to kill me. But I had to know the answer. It came within seconds as the burns healed over, leaving pinkish, fresh skin in its wake. I could hardly believe my luck! This was some kind of miracle cure-all, it seemed. But I needed to do further experimentation to see what its limits were. As I mentioned, I was working in the area under the guise of a nursery hospital. One of the patients who had been brought to me was a young boy who had been bitten by a hydrophobic dog. There had never been any chances that he would recover, but I was fascinated to study the effects that rabies had on his body as he slowly died. Now a thought came to me. No matter what effect the cream I now possessed had, <laughs> it could hardly do more than kill the boy, which the rabies was already well in the course of achieving. So, I applied some of the salve to the bitten areas and waited to see what would occur. Within hours, I was witness to the most astonishing of changes. The symptoms of the disease had vanished almost entirely, and he appeared to be recovering well. I had visions of being the first man to announce a cure for rabies, which would surely have brought me fame and fortune towards neither of which I am averse. However, as I watched, something even more astonishing began to take place. The boy, I realised, was growing hair on the exposed skin. Now, this was a boy of perhaps ten years of age, no more. How could this be happening? As I watched, his body became more and more distorted, and I realised that he was gradually taking on the characteristics of a dog, which were becoming admixed with his human characteristics. This was utterly unforeseen and unheard of. I knew that I was on the verge of the major discovery of my life here. The gelatinous mess was somehow fusing the boy's human characteristics to that of a canine. You imagine how excited this made me. I stayed up for three days in a row, watching and waiting to see him record every small changes, to note every detail. It was fascinating, watching this gel change the boy into a viable hybrid. I realised that this gel was more than simply some kind of healing cream for that unearthly creature that had perished in the blaze. I had noted that the being had possessed a kind of amorphous structure, presumably on the cellular level, this creature had been similarly uncertain. The salve, in order to heal, must have therefore needed to somehow analyse what was to be repaired and then accomplish the deed. As I watched, I worked feverishly. I had a good supply of salve, but it would hardly last forever. I experimented in various ways, 
and finally came up with a method that enabled me to reproduce the gel if I supplied it with the raw elements it needed to reproduce itself. This left me with a self-regenerating supply of gel, which now rests in the large vat within my current laboratory. On the way here, however, the hybrid managed to escape the carriage bearing it and roam free on the moors until it was slain a few nights ago. I didn't really care whether it lived or died, for my studies of the beast had enabled me to formulate my plans and to work on achieving my goal. Financed by Breckenridge, this laboratory area was hollowed out of old caves in the rocky cliffs and connected to this factory above. Here is where I was able to plan my next step. The creation not of an individual, but an entire race. Breckenridge supplied me with a prime suspect, a young street urchin. He wanted a species that could live and work underwater, <laughs> which was a ticklish proposition. <laughs> In the end, I managed to create a dolphin-like creature that possessed gills. This I then grafted into my test subjects, to my delight. The grafting took instantly, and I was able to monitor her changes. She came through it perfectly, and this is the proud leader of my new superhuman race. Training the children was one thing, but training them was quite another. Like so many children, they did not wish to work to repay us for our efforts. We were therefore left with no option but to compel them by force to do what we wished. For that, we needed guards. I took several immature harbour seals and grafted human elements into them. These elements are taken from fluids extracted from recently deceased humans. This increases both their intelligence and their aggression levels. It rendered them perfect for the task. They guard the merfolk and ensure that they work as required. They also patrol the areas to keep out intruders and spies. I have achieved my dream, and even as we speak, the new race that I have envisioned and formed is working on the seabed. I have achieved the greatest possible triumph for a man of science. I have turned my dreams into reality. You're mad. You know that? Sadly, one of the guards was slain last night, and I need to produce a replacement. This is where you will provide me with the help I need, Sarah. Your fluids will enable me to mutate a new guard and allow my work to continue. You should be very proud of your contribution to science. Thanks a lot. But I could skip the honour. Couldn't I just leave my body in my will? Come now, don't be so reactionary. You have to die anyway. Since you persisted in investigating matters that were none of your concern. The guards would happily murder you for an evening's entertainment if I allowed it, but they would be unlikely to return your corpse to me in a state that I could use. This way, I promise you a painless death and some achievement once you have expired. Wouldn't you prefer that? Can I sleep on it and let you know in the morning? <laughs> oh, I'm rather sorry to lose you, Sarah. You do provide me with such amusement. Court jester extraordinaire. That's me. Look, why don't you just buy me a nice fool's costume and I'll be happy to hang around and entertain you. I'm sorry, but that's not a viable option. Goodbye, Sarah. It's been a pleasure chatting with you, but I'm afraid that this is the end now. I'm on a rather tight schedule, you know, and business is business. Now, let's begin. <laughs>